I know God is good to his word. He's good for what he said. That's exactly it. There are some people that today are just like Herod. They're misinformed about the truth. The first thing that happens is they are condemned. The Bible says he stands at the door of our heart and knocks, and we want him to come in to sup with us. We want him to rule and reign in our lives. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled. And all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And just taking that as my Bible reading and text, I'd like to preach for a little while on the title of a message, We Must Find the Messiah. We Must Find the Messiah. Brother John, would you please stand in prayer of the message in the message? Amen. We must find the Messiah. Uh, we're going to start with a Christmas theme. I think we're close enough. I think there was a joke going around back in October when we had, I think, freezing freezing weather below, you know, zero. I don't know. No, not below zero. Come on now. Uh, 30 something. We had snow uh, that somebody said somebody decorated for Christmas too early. That's why we got all this bad weather in October. Um, but I don't think this is too early. We're coming up with Christmas this week. So we're going to go ahead and start with the Christmas theme message. We must find the Messiah. Let's go ahead and start actually before Christ was even born. Let's go back to the almost the very beginning, but we're going to precede Christ's birth. Let's start as the Bible says that this birth was foreordained before the foundation of the world. 1 Peter 1, 18 through 20. For as much as ye know that ye were redeemed with corruptible thing, were not, rather, for as much uh, as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained, before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. So in other words, of the very solution to the problems of the world today, the very answer to a lot of prayers was implemented before the problems came to be. I know a lot of people oh, will profess that, well, if God is all loving God and all knowing God, why is it that there's so many problems? Why is there so much trouble in the world? If he's all-knowing, all-loving, why doesn't he uh, stop this from happening and stop this from this, allow, this being allowed to happen and so on and so forth? But what we just read is that Christ was foreordained, the very sacrifice of Christ. In order for there to be a sacrifice, there had to be a birth of Christ. And this came before the world came. The answer, if you believe Jesus Christ is the answer for the world today, then it's important to know that he was foreordained. God had made a plan for the redemption of man. God had made a plan. He had had an answer for the problems of the world today before they even came to be. Before. Uh, it wasn't an afterthought. If you know anything about Amarillo, you know about our on, on and off ramps. Sometimes they feel like they're an afterthought. You get on the freeway, you're getting off, or you're getting on, and it seems like it only takes two seconds to get off or on. Was this an afterthought? 
did they put the, you know, did they put the freeway there? And they were like, oh, they'll figure that out later. No, it's more like in the case, if I can kind of sidestep a little bit in stories, it was more like what happened to Abraham. Abraham had a promise. God gave him a promise and he fulfilled that promise, but um, there was some obstacles in the way as Isaac was, uh, God had asked Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, which was the promise. Um, some people would say that that promise, though, um, that, uh, some people would say that if Isaac was killed, then God would have to raise him back up. Why? Because they know God is good to his word. He's good for what he said. Uh, God pre-plans, amen? He goes out of his way to plan. And that's what he did with Christ. That's what he did before he was born. Um, God gives us the opportunity of escape during our tribulation and our trial. 1 Corinthians 10 and 13, there have no uh, temptation taken you, but such as, in common, as, is, as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation all, also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. We know that when there's temptation, God gives us a way of escape, but I'd like to just take it a little step further and again say God made a way. God gave us an answer. God gave us, if you believe Jesus Christ is the answer of our problems, he gave it to us before those problems came. So before, let's, let's keep talking about what happened before the very birth. So not only was there a plan for our problems, but how did those problems even come to be? What are you talking about? What were these problems? Before Christ was born, there was a gentleman, an, an angelic being named Lucifer. Lucifer, and the Bible says that there was iniquity found in his heart. He became the enemy of God. He wanted to overthrow God before Christ was even born, and, and maybe the very reason of Christ being born was, uh, was, um, was, was driven by this enemy of God. God had a plan to get rid of sin, to get rid of evil, and, and Christ was a part of that. But there was iniquity found in the heart of Satan. Satan was an angelic uh, uh, a being who was right under the Trinity. He was the most beautiful uh, creation of God. Ezekiel 28, 13 through 15 says, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardis, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold, and gold, rather. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. And I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in, uh, in thee. Until iniquity was found in thee. How was iniquity found in Satan? The Bible doesn't necessarily explain that. But we do know that it was found in there. How was it in there? I don't know. I don't know. We have to allow the Bible to be black and white. We have to allow the Bible to express what it expressed, and, um, and we can't assume what it doesn't explain. We have to assume we can't put assumptions in the Bible. A lot of people, maybe uh, some people want to go that direction, but just like I've explained with the, sometimes with the Trinity, explaining some things in the Bible, um, we, uh, the best way I've heard it explained is it's kind of unexplainable. It doesn't uh, necessarily, ex we don't have experiential evidence of some of the things in the Word. We have to allow the Word to say what it say and doesn't say what it doesn't say. Amen. I also think of this term, also e the etern uh, eternity. Eternity, we understand terms as, uh, as time. We understand terms uh, of things not being um, in existence. So we understand there being uh, eternity where there is no time, time. But all we understand is what we've been born in. We understand time only. 
Bible says right now we look through a glass darkly, but one day we will know even as also we are known. So I'm trying not to, I'm trying to stay on topic. Here we go. We must find the Messiah. So Satan came. He was wanting to go after the Messiah. He said we must find him. He wanted to destroy him. He wanted to get rid of him. He was uh, angry against God and he wanted to overthrow God. And we believe this and we believe uh, and, and oh, that's what I was getting to. We didn't understand how iniquity was in his heart. So, but why do we believe something like this if it's not explained in the Bible? We believe because thus saith the word of God. What are you talking about? Thus saith the word of God. We have, as Christians, we have revelation knowledge. Revelate, there's many studies and myth, different uh, ways to know things, uh, and we learn in school different categories of knowledge, but what we have is revelationary uh, Re revelationary knowledge. That means thus saith the word of God. Thus saith the word of God. We understand that. We under because what's, what, how that is proven is because of the life of Jesus Christ. We have the, the, the birth, life, uh, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We have uh, what he claimed. And he claimed to be God. There's no neutrality. He claimed to be God. Amen. We have to take him at his word. Or not. It's our choice. But we have to understand that uh, we have the, the proof of God. We have the, uh, the evidence of Jesus' life. Amen. That's how we understand God is eternal. We understand the truths of God. All right. Um, we understand, as the Bible said in Deuteronomy 33 and 27, the eternal God is thy refuge. And underneath are the everlasting arms, and he shall thrust out the enemy from before thee, and shall say, destroy him. Here is evidence God is eternal. We know that from the word of God, and we know the word of God is true because of Jesus Christ. All right, let's keep going. We must find Christ in history, his story. We just read to you about uh, how Christ had become. All right, and we also talked to you about uh, how Satan wanted to get rid of Christ. Let's read a little bit about how uh, Satan wanted to, the process in which he wanted to find the Messiah. He wanted to hurry up and find the Messiah. Genesis 3 and 15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So this is the very first uh, encounter we have. The very first encounter we have that Satan wanted to attack the seed of, of man, which was going to be Jesus Christ. We find that he tempted Adam and Eve in the garden. That was his first attempt. And this is what I just read was the conflict that was going to come um, from Satan and the seed. Let's keep going. What else happened? What, how else was, was uh, Satan trying to find this Messiah for evil intentions? How else was he going to find him? Next, we have uh, Adam and Eve's uh, first sons, Cain and Abel. Satan persisted in this effort from the very beginning. Cain, the first child born to Adam and Eve, killed his brother Abel. When Abel was killed, another son was born to Adam and Eve. His name was Seth. He was, in, he was in the promised line of the deliverer. Throughout history, the serpent has continued his attempt with no success to destroy the promised line. So here uh, we see an attempt of uh, Cain trying to slew, sl slay Abel, which he did, but there was another uh, son born, which continued the line, and Satan again failed in his attempt to destroy, and to, uh, yeah, to destroy Jesus to allow him not to come. What was another attempt? Another attempt was with the giants. The giants. Oh, man, the Nephilim. People get all caught up in this whole Nephilim and demons. And, you know, look, you know, you got the movies, you got the horror movies, right? People get caught up in this power of, of Satan and demons. And they have the, the, the movies where they're holding up the cross and the wind is blowing them back and they're trying to cast out the demons. But we know the real story. We know Jesus is the king of all. He'll have the last say. We know that he has the power. He re, he's the one that really controls all. He has the power over Satan. We know the end of the story. 
And we know that it's actually the opposite way. It was, a, it was the other way around as they tried to apprehend Jesus. What happened that everyone else fell down. Everyone else backed up. Everyone else could not apprehend him. But anyway, so yes, it was the giants. Genesis 6, 1 through 4. What am I talking about? It says, and it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always uh, strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they, were be and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. So here, fallen angels, fallen angels tried to, again, corrupt the seed of man, ending up trying to corrupt the seed that would eventually come as Jesus Christ. One more. Well, I got two more, a couple more. In the book of Esther, in the book of Esther, we have an example of the attempted destruction of the entire nation of Israel. A decree went out to destroy all of the Jews. And we find this in Esther. We, read, we talked about this before. King Ahasuerus stamped the decree to take out all of the, uh, all of the children of Israel. But then there was another decree signed uh, that they were able to defend themselves against the genocide. So that failed. And now we come to our Bible reading. We find Satan behind Herod. In the slaughtering of the innocent babies in Bethlehem, in attempting to kill the baby Jesus, Satan was trying to keep Jesus from fulfilling his mission. This brings us to our Bible reading, Matthew 2, 1 through 8. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen a star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him in Bethlehem of Judea, uh, Judea for Thus it is written by the prophet, and, and thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Ju uh, Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when ye have found him, bring me word again, that I may come and worship him also. Herod, we see here at the end, he, he sort of <laughs> was lying. He not sort of was lying, but he was lying, trying to let everyone know that he wanted to worship, uh, worship Jesus, this baby Jesus. He wanted to send those wise men there so that they could let him know all about um, uh, if it was true or not, if Jesus was born, if there was a baby really born, if the Messiah was really born. He said, we must find the Messiah. But the reason why he wanted to find him, as we see here in the beginning, uh, that he was troubled. He was troubled at his birth. What was really going on and why was he troubled? Why would he believe these three wise men, or the wise men, the Bible doesn't say it was three. Why would he believe these wise men, the magi? These were religious figures back in that day that was highly respected. It sounds, uh, so, so, so not only did he have the wise men, but he had that star. These were all things that were going through his mind. He had that evidence of that star, so obviously he had heard in prophecy about a star that would point towards the Messiah coming. So all these things troubled him. It troubled him. And it troubled him because I feel as if he knew that his time was coming to an end. 
He felt as if his reign was coming to an end as king. He was very jealous, filled with pride. And he didn't want his reign to come to an end. But what he didn't understand is he was misinformed. What he didn't understand is that Jesus wasn't coming to take over his throne. The Bible says he was coming as a lamb. He was coming to take on, take on hell and the grave. This isn't the time that he was going to come and rule and reign as not only Herod misunderstood, but so many others misunderstood. Thought he was coming to take over the, the land, come to, come to be king over the lands and the nations and, and rule you know, over, over the Roman Empire. And, but he wasn't coming to do that. He was misunderstood. So he made the mistake. He made that mistake. But not only that, he wanted to send someone else to sort of do his dirty work. He said, we must find this Messiah. But he didn't actually follow through with it the way it would have been most beneficial. He actually had someone else. He was trying to go through, go through it by someone else going to find out for him. You know, if he really would have wanted to know the truth, maybe if he would have went on his own, he would have, things would have been different. Maybe just like those shepherds, and I'm kind of getting ahead of myself to maybe another message, but you know what happened to these shepherds that the angels came down and, and testified, and you know, this miracle happened. All of a sudden, they didn't even, they didn't even know it was going to happen. I'm not saying, the Bible didn't say this would, would have happened, but maybe it would have been a little different if he would have went to meet the Messiah himself. But he had others do his dirty work. So everyone thought and was, was misinformed about the truth about Jesus. But we've all heard of John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But sometimes we stop there. But let's keep reading. What else does the Bible say about Jesus' coming? It says, for God sent him, rather God, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, as Herod was thinking, to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Herod's problem is that he was misinformed about the truth. So he was condemned already. He didn't have the right belief in his heart. So he was condemned already. What does that say about us this morning? What does it say about people in general? What does it say about people who are, are like Herod? Uh, that's exactly it. There are some people that today are just like Herod. They're misinformed about the truth. Uh, they're misinformed. And, and when they hear about Christ, they hear about this baby, Jesus. Uh, the first thing that happens is they are condemned. The first thing that, they ha that happens to them is they feel uh, intimidated about Jesus coming to rule and to reign, not necessarily here on earth, not necessarily here over the kingdoms of this earth, though when God does come into the heart of men and women, he does change things here on earth, but it's more uh, uh, in the aspect of the kingdom of their hearts that God is going to come to give uh, uh, authority. He's going to take over the, the very uh, throne of the hearts of men and women. I preached about this not too long ago. We shall have a king. And those that love God, those that love Jesus Christ, we are wanting that day. We're looking forward to that day that Jesus Christ comes to reign and to, and to rule and reign here on earth. But not only that, since we love Jesus, we believe in Jesus, we don't mind him coming and taking over our hearts, taking over the throne of our hearts. The Bible says he stands at the door of our heart and knocks, and we want him to come in to sup with us. We want him to rule and reign in our lives. Amen. We want him to come in and rule and reign in our lives. Hallelujah. Amen. 
We believe that and we're looking forward to that day, but it's not, uh, it's not the case for everyone else. You know, some others that, you know, they say we must find the Messiah, but it's not with good intentions. Uh, they have evidence that they want to deny. King Herod had the star that, kn that he knew once he saw that star that there was going to be a king born, but he tried to push it out of his mind. He tried to suppress the truth, and that's how it is with some folks that they say that there's not enough evidence but there really is they suppress the truth and unrighteousness because they know their time is coming up short it's coming short their time is getting ready uh, uh, to come to an end as king of their own lives, king of their own hearts, king of their own decisions. But when Jesus comes, uh, he's coming to help us uh, and to uh, allow us to live in a better life. But they're under a, a misunderstanding. They're under a misunderstanding about what Jesus really wants, but uh, they know their time is coming short. Philippians 2 and 10 says that... At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, should bow, of things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth. They know that it's coming, the time is coming, it's coming to an end. Um, so that's why they are troubled. But their reason why they're troubled is because they have half truths. Like Herod, he didn't have all the real truth about Jesus Christ. He thought that he was coming to take over, uh, you know, the kingdom and all this thing and, and, and the nation and all these other things, but he didn't have it right. Some, sometimes people don't have their perception of Jesus Christ right. They, they think he's uh, just uh, uh, wanting to uh, bombard or uh, they just don't have the right idea about Christ. One lady I spoke about before, they, she said, I believe in what you probably believe God is, but I believe in the universe. You know, because the universe loves and accepts everyone, but when it comes to God, boy, you know, he's sending people to hell, and God is taking 10% of your money, and God's doing this, and God's doing that. And she had the wrong idea of, about uh, her perception on the Lord because she had half-truths. Maybe it's because everything she heard about Jesus was through somebody else. She didn't go find the Messiah for herself, but if she would have found him for herself, maybe she would have tasted and saw that the Lord is good. You, we have to find and must find the Messiah for ourselves. We want Jesus Christ to come and to make his abode in our life. There's enough evidence there. We can't deny it. Ultimately, some people may even come to the point where they seem peaceable. But we have to, again, we have to express that there's no neutrality. Here, Herod, what did he say? Oh, I'll worship him. Just tell me where he is. I'll worship him. And some people want to throw, you know, act as if they're, they're accepting and tolerant. But in the end of, at the end of the day, there's really a denial of Christ. I like what Frank Turk said, and I've quoted him before, but he said, as he is answering questions from people and going back and forth, giving answers, answering questions, and after he gets so far and he's not really getting anywhere, he just asks the questions, if, he asks the question, if Christianity were true, would you become a Christian? If you really believed that it was true, would you become a Christian? In other words, is evidence really the problem or is it your problem with God? Do you have a, are you misinformed about Jesus Christ? We must find him ourselves. And I'm getting ready to close this morning. We must find the Messiah. We must find him for ourselves so that we then have the re uh, reality in God. We have the truth of God. Looking for the Messiah, finding the Messiah, finding out when we find him, we taste and see that the Lord is good, we find out that he has so prepared a plan for us. He so loves us. He so cared for us. 
that if you believe Jesus Christ is the answer for your problem, your situation, he has already made a way before we even understood what the problem was, and we continue to trust and believe in him this morning.